Welcome to the Lenovo's journey with Drupal and creating 100 plus languages, language specific sites presentation. Uh, we are going to talk to you about our implementation of Drupal, but since the presentation uh, of this topic to DrupalCon, Lenovo has chosen to use Google Translate. And so for the next 30 minutes, we're going to talk about Google Translate. I'm just kidding, we're gonna actually talk about that. <laughs> All right, thank you for laughing. I really appreciate that. <laughs> um, so what we propose to talk about is discussing the complexities involving in creating a multi and maintaining in numerous languages for this website. Um, we'll share three main challenges. There are many other challenges. Uh, we've taken over uh, multiple sites that were uh, running, that Lenovo was managing for their marketing um, site. It's not their main site. It's the tech today, that Lenovo.com site that are uh, used to drive campaigns from around the world. And we've chosen Drupal as the implementation uh, for this product. So some of the challenges that we're going to talk about is how to determine localization. So in other words, how to drive traffic from around the world to the proper site. As you'll see, there are about 100 different URLs that are directed, um, that, that are generated in order to manage those languages. So how to get the users to the right one. Talk a little bit about the translation problems that we've run into. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the performance issues that we've uh, encountered and are still uh, managing. I am, um, I'm not going to get as technical as you probably would like me to, therefore, John. Hello. Hello. Uh, we'll answer the technical aspects of this presentation and we'll do a little bit of um, show and tell. Uh, we'll try. Yeah, that's all we can do. And of course, we'll take questions at the end. So, of course, a little bit about us. Uh, we are from Promet. We are Prometheans. We are a Drupal site that builds, uh, we're a Drupal site. We're a Drupal agency that builds Drupal sites. Uh, two highlights I want to leave you with. We have our own distribution, production ready for government and higher ed. You can actually test drive it, just like Dries talked about uh, um, space shot. We have, uh, for an email, you can have access to that distribution for three days, no hosting, um, just to play around with it. So stop by our booth, it's called Provis. And the other plug, uh, since I have your attention, is we've just launched our Drupal-based AI search uh, for one of our uh, government customers. You may check that out, it's a live product, stop by our booth. Uh, it's um, essentially a conversational search that plugs into Drupal and uh, utilizes um, currently Jet Chat GPT, but other LLMs that you can use out there. So thanks for, thanks for the commercial um, break here. My name is Andy Koharski. I am the president and founder of Promet Source. I'm John Lutz. I'm a senior Drupal developer. And we've been, I've been doing Drupal, well, doing is a loose word. Um, <clears throat> I talk about Drupal uh, since 2008 when we first came to a DrupalCon in Boston. Uh, and uh, just like the slogan does, we, we uh, came for the code, stayed for community, and I've only missed one DrupalCon since then. John? Um, I started off doing web design uh, and graphic design. Wow. And, yeah. You didn't know that. No. <laughs> I found Drupal and fell in love. It was actually views that helped me fall in love with Drupal. And so anyway, I'm primarily back-end developer at this point. Started with Drupal, end of Drupal 5, and been doing exclusively Drupal for like 15 years. And been with Promet for five years. And this is my third DrupalCon. Wow, so you're a designer. I had no idea. Yeah, a long time ago. Don't ask for design. <laughs> All right, let's get serious. So Lenovo is a global brand, a global company. 
It has 63,000 employees that internally at Lenovo speak, speak over 100 different languages. Um, the arch marketing organization identified 100 different, 180 markets to target around the world. So the complexity of the language uh, challenge is pretty vast. Uh, and not only is it for external users, but also internally. So as you can, it, it is a fairly distributed company. Uh, so in terms of the marketing uh, teams, they have um, some centralized roles and products releases and communication, uh, but marketing is decentralized. So you have marketing teams around the world that are responsible for different um, markets and marketing to those. So whenever we first heard this requirement, 100 different languages, I just thought this, this has got to be like that's, that can't really be right. Is there really that many languages out there? And so we looked it up. Anybody know how many languages, officially known languages are there out there? Like a guess? 2,000, 4,000. I got, it's still going up. That's going not, once. Uh, 7,139, according to Ethnologue Guide. Wow. Ethnologue Guide. This is just an image uh, from Wikipedia uh, that uh, demonstrates some of the, mo the first languages. Uh, as a side note, um, in the United States, we have a pretty um, English-centric note. I had, I had a dinner uh, with somebody uh, not too long ago, and I picked up an accent. I just wanted to, to figure out where this person was from. And I said, well, so what is your first language? And I got a really interesting response. Why do you ask about first language? I thought, OK. I, kind of screwed up. So this person grew up with multiple languages, and I realized that that's probably a reality for a lot of people outside of the United States. And there is no first language, and then you pick up another language, but there are multiple languages that are spoken. There might be an official language, there might be a school language, there might be a dialogue spoken at home. So um, that's pretty uh, interesting um, side note here. So great, there are 7,000 languages. We're not going to market to 7,000 languages because not a lot of those languages are widely adopted. There are small populations that speak them. And unfortunately, they don't have a lot of money for a global brand to target them. So uh, this is a representation of the world based on GDP. So um, you can see, you probably heard this, California and Texas are larger than most countries um, out on this map, but this is a representation, and it, I, I picked this to kind of help uh, everyone think about how Lenovo thinks of languages and markets, right? So we're looking at uh, regions in the world that have a different language um, and have um, an addressable market that will buy servers, laptops, and devices from uh, Lenovo. And also that helps us identify where the marketers or think about, and I don't actually know the actual breakdown of the marketing teams and but where they might be residing in the world. So there is a, there's an there's a Asia team, definitely a Europe team, um, and US and other markets. So we actually don't have 100 languages there. We have 100 different region language combinations. So we, for example, have English is probably the larger num largest number of um, language pair, language region pairs that we have out there. Why? Well, there are differences in spoken sp spelling in English. If you uh, uh, color is not the spell same the same spelled the same way in the United States as it is in Britain. Um, different, um, different, different differences in different regions. So we have English in New Zealand. We have a, we have a pair of English New Zealand, English Australia, English India, English Great Britain, English United States. Uh, those are still unique translations to that market. As a marketer, you really don't want to, and if you're trying to appeal to the local market and speak to that local market, you don't really want to be obvious and misspell uh, a word, uh, you know, color spelled differently here would be pretty obvious that uh, that marketer is not speaking to me. Same thing with French and other languages is researching through this. Um, there, there are variances and it's going to continue that those languages are going to deviate uh, from the original. 
So here's what a current or recent snapshot of the sitemap looks like. So we have uh, 93 language pairs here. So as you can see, this gets, and John will talk a little bit about how this works. It gets split up into the region. So the first one is A-E-E-N. Yeah, so that's the country code and then the, <sighs> the, the, the language. <laughs> yeah, I was just, I just trying to figure out what A-E uh, was. Um, so you can see down the line, um, we have uh, 93 pairs of those. And, and we started with uh, a lot more. And I should say, well, so this is what this looks like. Um, pretty standard screenshot of this is uh, French. And this is a version in Korean. And this is a Japanese um, region language representation. And here are, uh, here's a landing page. I think this is an English language page. And then there is a, um, I think a solutions page. And I wanted to show you this because as you can see, uh, these are fairly represent representative pages on this site. And so we're not talking about thousands of news releases or press releases. These are, uh, as you probably can imagine, either paragraphs or um, layout builder um, pages. We'll, go, we'll come back to this, but this actually represented a pretty big challenge uh, for us because uh, that's not just one node that we have to translate, there are multiple uh, blocks or paragraphs that we have to get out and send for translation. So a little bit of history, as I could say, an olden story. We inherited this site about seven, six years ago. I, six years ago. 2018, yeah. 19, I think. Wow, time flies. Um, and uh, the challenge was there were still desperate sites that are that were managed by different regions and different countries. Um, they needed to be brand compliant, and there there was a a want of central control, yet decentralized my ability to decentralize those pieces of content to those marketers. And the way that the solution was approached at that time was there are some centralized countries or centralized languages that we um, started managing, but there's still separate sites that were managed in separate countries, right? So there was a little bit of a struggle on how to ensure uh, brand cohesiveness, yet uh, distribute the control of fine tuning to those markets. Because they were running campaigns that, that cost, that were, they were spending probably millions of dollars to run the campaigns into those markets. So a, a very fine tuning would result in, in um, could result in some big uh, changes to the results of those campaigns. And the first approach was to um, move those sites closer to uh, the regions. Essentially, we're trying to figure out how to um, get the users from a different country or city or region to the proper uh, site. And I will come back to this, but so we centralized the entire stack um, we used AWS to build out our infrastructure and we decided to have a Drupal website, a one Drupal website, plus so we distributed content editing to different marketing departments and we were going to use translation, translate modules to um, manage all the different languages and uh, regions. So this is what the stack looks like. This, this, um, this evolved and we will come back to this stack because we'll talk about another challenge that came out of this. So the solution was actually surprisingly simple. Um, we, used, uh, we used Cloudflare GeoIP. Uh, I want to give credit to Greg O'Toole. Uh, when I was uh, doing research for <laughs> this presentation, this was the best uh, graphical representation of how uh, the Cloudflare GeoIP works. So essentially, it, uh, it's pretty simple. It, it identifies 
uh, where you're sitting, um, uh, and as it sends your request through, it tags, it creates a header um, tag in the HTTP header, right, John? Yep, that's right. Um, that encodes the country and other, uh, and find more finely grained uh, location details. I think it just does the country okay, of sorry. our implementation. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so we use that with great success. Like once we implemented this, we've heard very little complaints of uh, countries not getting the traffic that they thought they uh, deserve um, or where uh, folks were uh, working. So not a lot to talk about here, sorry. This works pretty well. Uh, I just wanna bring oh, up, yes. uh, the main reason I believe we're using this is for vanity URLs. So um, if, you know, if someone gets to the site and they go walk around the site and they decide to go to another language, this is all working within the site. Drupal's managing those URLs pretty well. The reason they implemented the GOIP uh, with Cloudflare is because um, marketing teams wanted to use fairly short, tiny URLs, you know, vanity URLs for their campaigns um, and not, you know, have these really long GBEN titles on them for a hundred different people. So they wanted one URL. They were previous to this solution managing this all in Akamai with, with rules to send them to different people. So it was spending a lot, they were spending a lot of money on each campaign someone having at Akamai or having to adjust these rule or um, add these URLs in. So this was a solution that basically when you <clears throat> hit um, just solutions education or something like that in your, in your uh, URL, when it gets to Drupal, Drupal already has the, the, um, the uh, country header back from, uh, from Cloudflare, and then from there, we append the correct uh, um, prefix to get it to um, to the correct translation. If that makes sense. Thanks, John. Yep. All right. So problems one solved: we're directing traffic to the right URL, to the right region, to the right language. So how do we translate this content into 100 different languages? Um, not Google Translate. Uh, Lenovo chose Lionbridge as a service to translate uh, all the content. Is there anything to be said about Lionbridge? It's a translation service. Their whole business is dedicated to translation. Um, it works really well. Uh, I believe it's human. Yes, it's human based. Human based, yes. Yeah. Although, as a um, side note, um, Lenovo is now experimenting with um, LLM based translations. Um, they have seen it, it just staggering savings in, um, uh, in cost uh, by using. Um, uh, LLM, and it's uh, apparently pretty good. But uh, for now, we're using humans via language. So the ask was that uh, a, con a piece of content would be generated, uh, that content would be saved and then sent off for translation, asynchronous translation. It would come back uh, with 100 different versions in those 100 different languages, um, and the marketers would be alerted when that uh, language, a piece of content was ready in their language. So our first attempt was to use the TTGMM. Do you want to talk about that, John? Help me out here. Um, well, the first automatic attempt at uh, connecting over to Lionbridge um, we used, well, first of all, we used um, a module called TG, TMGMT, and it basically helps, it's like a layer on top of what Drupal core translation will give you in 
like an interface to see jobs of um, translations that you want to send off to a service. And it's supposed it's pluggable so that you can plug it into other services. So the original attempt to automate the translation part of this used a proprietary um, Lionbridge uh, connector module. It did not work correctly. Um, they were getting lots of errors. It was very buggy. So they decided not to use it. Yeah, I should maybe uh, highlight it in case it, it's not clear that Lionbridge themselves have their own workflows and their own proprietary tools that they use to manage the translations. So the, uh, they do not go into our Drupal instance and like manage the translations. Oh, no. Right, so, it, it, so the idea here is that because it's a lot of content uh, and it get up, gets updated fairly frequently, the content gets sent over to their systems where they do the time tracking, quality controls, they have their whole entire process there. And then once it's complete, it gets sent back to us. That's, so that's the um, reason why we have to have, have some of this extra uh, uh, technology there. Uh, so we had problems. Uh, some of the problems were um, had to do with the um, mon the modules themselves. The other problems we had were with the fact that we were dealing with paragraphs and blocks, and those are hopefully not much longer, but they they weren't considered as the primary use case in those translation modules. So. Uh, that's why when we looked at the page before, let's, oops, my menu is stuck, but there's a lot of different pieces of content here. It's not just one um, piece of one node like we talked about before. It's not like a one press release. There's a lot of pieces that go out and they're, they're usually short pieces of content, but as you can imagine, they're pretty important to get it right. Some more problems. No, we can go back to this. You want to go back to this? So basically, we were stuck. Uh, our automatic solutions were not working. The modules that we were uh, uh, building were not working. Uh, even the um, Lionbridge module, which has about, I think, about 100 um, in, um, reported installs uh, wasn't working for us. So the team came up with a, um, with a interesting solution. Um, and that is we are, uh, and, and this is actually still in process. So what we're doing is we are exporting the different block sections and sending it out to um, via JSON or YAML file and uh, sending it out to Lionbridge systems and then getting it back and importing it. So um, I'm not sure if this is um, released on Drupal.org, but this is essentially what it looks like, the content sync. Um, we have some import UI back on that. Um, so this is unfortunately still a little bit um, manual. Uh, we are working on implementing the API uh, solution so that we can get those blocks sent sent out and 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 received back. Anything else to add to that? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> the other problem that we ran into, a really big one, um, was that because those landing pages were uh, had so many paragraphs. Uh, initially, the site was uh, built with paragraphs seven years ago, so that's where we started. Uh, as you can see here, the performance on saving a page, uh, especially a, a one that was built out with many paragraphs, was pretty unacceptable. Um, so we had something like, you know, this graph represents, a, this is a New Relic screenshot, of those of you who are familiar with it, it represents um, web transaction time. So somewhere in the half a minute time, that's like pretty, pretty, pretty nearly eternity, right, when you're <laughs> waiting for something to come back. Uh, that had to do with the fact that as we're saving 
a node with, let's say, 20 paragraphs on it that each of them had to be translated into 100 different languages, it was saving you know, 2,000 2, yeah. 2, yeah. nodes uh, just continually writing to the database. So the database was choking and we were running out of uh, resources when we're uh, doing, uh, doing that. So go back to hardware. Let's try to try to solve this with some hardware configuration. And um, that's what we did for the most part. Uh, so what we did is we, this is not a, a, a perfect representation of how this works. So I'm gonna try to use words to assist with this image. But um, what we have is we have two essentially Drupal sites running. Um, we have what we call the production site at which uh, serves the anonymous users uh, with, tra with uh, requests and response to that through Akamai, and we will talk a little bit about Akamai. Well, actually, I'll just mention it right now. We basically don't depend a lot on the AWS infrastructure here. We really leverage Akamai for all that it's supposed to do and deliver the content to the edge. So we have something like a 90 three to 97% hit ratio on, on, um, on this side of the uh, infrastructure. Most of it is just delivered through Akamai, and so uh, it's pretty fast. What we did to separate these is we have another um, environment which we call pre-prod. It's actually a pretty hefty environment where the content editing happens, and once the content editing happens, then um, the files that are associated images and the databases are synced in near, nearly real time. So while this performance, th this is, um, we boosted up the, the performance on the database side uh, so that the content editors don't have that painful experience. So that is one way that we um, are solving it. It's still not perfect, but it's much better. Anything to add to that? My elbow there, or no? What's that? My elbow there. Yeah, that's what I'll Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, like, part of the issue with the um, he brought up the saving of a node that has twenty or forty paragraphs on it that with a hundred languages attached to it. The problem is you're saving this node, and right when you save it, it's saving all the other versions of uh, all the other languages into the database at the same time, and that's where the resource hit uh, was an issue. Um, they didn't see it in the beginning. Um, they saw it in the more languages started to be added on to where we got to 100 languages and when people started using lots and lots more paragraphs onto the node. Um, so the solution to that was that we started using Layout Builder and used blocks instead of paragraphs. And the, the reason that that saved us is that when you're editing in Layout Builder, that's all saving asynchronously. So when you're saving a block, it's just saving that block and all the translations of that block then, not at the end when you hit save on the, on the full node. So that really helped a ton on, on that particular problem. Thanks, John. Um, so here's what our, if anybody's interested, here's what our server list looks like. Um, We've, uh, we've had this reviewed with our AWS uh, solutions architects and um, they thought we did a pretty good job setting this up. Uh, there was something, oh, the, um, we switched to Redis from Memcache. We actually saw some improvement. Um, and we switched to our instance types, which saved us some money. That was like the extent of my AWS knowledge. And um, that concludes my part of the presentation. John, it's your turn. Sure. Thank you. Um, is there another slide? No, I can just do it. Oh, God. OK. Um, so we talked about the GOIP, and we talked about the um, performance issues. Um, 
we could talk about, uh, I, I guess I can show you the content sync part of that. Um, so the way we um, utilize content sync to help us out with this import export problem is we're basically utilizing internal things from the content sync module. What we're doing is um, just, uh, we um, pulled that out to a tab for each node. To make, we made it, made it so that you can get to a content sync export and import from the node itself rather than running content sync um, functions. So if I'm on, this is a pretty cool node here. Uh, if I'm on this node, um, uh, so we ex um, created this tab, or I'm sorry, this tab that basically gets you to an interface that Andy showed you that you can either export uh, JSON or YAML. Um, this is actually what is manually currently sent off to Lionbridge. Uh, they have governance on how they are to um, translate this. They send it back exactly the same way, and then they just pull in the import and it pulls it back into um, the site. Um, so the, the, the part that we're working on right now is to get this part working automatically through uh, Lion Bridges endpoints. Um, so that's one thing that's custom. Another thing that's custom is this publish tab, which is basically exactly like the translate. Well, not that's not a good example. It's basically only shows you the um, published uh, versions of this node rather than uh, having a page that. Um, a giant long list of, so if I go to the normal translate tab, this is within core, we're gonna see all the translations and some of them are translated and some of them are not. Uh, I, this was just an addition to help the marketers see the ones that have published versions really quickly. Um, so that's one thing. Um, I think one thing that maybe um, we didn't bring up yet that I figure I would mention is that um, Lenovo is really using this translation um, architecture for way more than just language. So um, if you see, I don't know if I have an example of it, but basically if you can imagine um, each one of these um, uh, paragraphs or block types, um, Basically, the, the, the workflow starts off, I believe, at uh, the um, home office, or the, the, the home of this, of this um, mothership. mothership, thank you, is in United Kingdom. So all the content starts there, I think, uh, predominantly. And then, um, basically what will happen, I think there is a, Oh, there's, there's also something we built in the back end that you can um, basically, instead of going to this translate tab and hitting add, add translation for every single one of the 100 languages, there's a, a bulk option in the content area where you can click and have that bulk create um, all the languages, or you can individually come in here and create languages for uh, each of the uh, pages that you want to get translated. Then, Either the uh, the um, what we what they call are geos, which are the uh, the groups of of different areas. There's four of them, so they will take uh, the pages that they're responsible for, and they will uh, either take it directly from there, do the export, send it off the line bridge, and have it come back and import it in. They're done, or they actually will make changes to uh, the node that is going to be, that they can put different content in than what is in uh, the, the UK version. So they could change out, um, they call them blades, like the sections of a page. 
they'll just completely replace them with, with other ones or they might change the picture or they do all kinds of things that aren't necessarily um, language translation with the system and they're usually utilizing the um, translations as a way to manage this. Yeah, thanks, John. Thanks for bringing that up. So one of the use cases there is uh, forms. So for example, if they have an intake tour form, like the objective of the entire site is to get leads, right? So they can have different tags on those leads to understand where it's coming from, which country, or, or other various uh, analytics tools they want on that, on that page. Um, slightly different content uh, on those blades, as John mentioned. So yeah, that, I thought that was a pretty clever way of maybe using the term personalization as a stretch, but s personalizing it a little bit further based on the region and the translation uh, for that region and country. Yeah, so here's a form, the form content type. So this is another language. They have different field content that's different language. It, but they're actually using uh, Marketo forms embedded into the, the pages. And so they'll use actually different Marketo forms that they just flip. Uh, switch out. Um, there's all kinds of actual pretty neat stuff that happens in this site. One, um, one is this uh, interactive asset. Um, it basically is a node that um, holds, let me find the, let me find this room one, it's pretty cool. This room configurator. Uh, let's go to the room configurator. Oh, maybe I don't know the URL. Oh, there it is. So um, let's start it. So this whole thing here is like um, a HTML and CSS and JS that. I, another team built, and they're all, it's all independent, it can work all on its own. Um, this, that whole interaction here, uh, all, all this cool stuff going on here, and you can see different ways you can configure using their products. Um, the reason I'm showing you is because, like this whole of the team built HTML, CSS, JS, they zip it up into these zip files, and then, um, where am I at? So on, the, on, the, uh, on one of these interactive assets, basically they're just uploading the, uh, the zip file onto the asset. And then when they're creating a landing page or a com um, there's, a, there's a block type and a paragraph that they can basically do a CTA that links to one of these um, or maybe they, you just you uh, you can attach one of these uh, interactive assets, and the preprocessor in the background basically explodes, uh, uh, unarchives that that zip file, um, and displays the whole thing. But the, the cool part that I thought was interesting was like if you look at inside the the HTML, it's all um, has JSON screen. Uh, uh, it has basically variables that don't have any kind of language associated with it. They look. They can provide um, um, lang uh, that text for each language inside of the interactive asset, or when you're adding it to a page, you can provide uh, these JSON the, these JSON variables that then get inserted into the interactive asset at, after it's um, unarchived and shown on the page. So that that room configurator basically. Um, is translatable. Uh, I just thought that was a neat little um, thing there. But um, everything is um, translatable. All the nodes, all blocks, all paragraphs. Um, like we were showing before, the um, they originally started off with this topic that is paragraph based and then eventually basically rebuilt it as a layout builder and rebuilt a lot of the um, block types that you can use. I don't think all of the block types. 
Um, we're good. We're good? Yeah. Okay. We're good. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we, we recognize it's lunchtime, so, and I think uh, we'll be happy to take questions if you have any. Whoa. Okay, yeah, thank you for uh, jumping in. So, 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 yeah, sorry, I should have highlighted this. So, for example, I believe this is Austrian, Deutsch, uh, uh, German. This is, I would imagine, Australian English. Maybe. Uh, I don't know what AO English is, but um, Canadian English, how about that? So we have country and then language, pairs. And that English is that, that any translation layer in that would be unique? So yes, that yes, that with correct. It, they're, I think they're, they're based more on the workflows of each of these geos. So it's more governance of how, how and when they translate and when they ask for translations. Right, that's, that's exactly right. It allows for finer control. So for example, if you, you may have uh, a, a region that's responsible for, let's say North America, right? So in North America, you're responsible for probably three or four languages, right? You're responsible for French, English, and I wonder if Canadian, I guess you have Canadian English. But like, let's say if we wanna split up the marketing team and say Canada and US, then you have US English, and then you have CA, E-N and C-A-F-R. So you have Canadian French and Canadian English. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. okay. Cookie consent, how do we manage that? Multiple languages and master language, yeah. Yeah, we always need to tell the other languages of speaking the master language. How you are managing? Is this a big deal that from like it's overall like uh, you have a master language and we update that content there? We need to notify all of the stakeholders for the other language. Please update the content to your side. Okay, so let's try um, cookie consent. That is using a contributed module currently that handles it. Would they are moving to something external, though. So we actually use Drupal cookie management? Yeah. That's incredible. So um, yeah, we're going to move to uh, something like uh, trust. Uh, it's something with an O. Oh, that's on there. Yeah. That's a good question. So I, unfortunately, I, I don't know. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to guess that based on the URL or it's going to look, look at the header, right? Because the Cloudflare sticks where you're at in the header, and so that's probably going to look at that. But my, I, I would highly recommend just outsourcing all of that to a third party. Then you don't have to manage it. It's the, I don't think the costs are prohibitive at all. I think on the second question, that's more of governance again. Uh, like there's processes in place for them to update things if they need to update them. Yes. They're primarily using Marketo forms. 
Are you asking, so the question was how do you use web form, we talk about, ask, the question was talk about web forms more and how do we handle the different translations. And my question back to you is, is, are you asking about the forms that a user fills, anonymous user fills out on a site? Submission. Submissions from the website. Like I want to buy Lenovo products. Okay, so I have two, three, three minutes. Is that right? Thank you. Uh, so that is out, outside of the scope of this project. It is Marketo, and we know we control which hmm. which form they you they. They configure which form for each language, so that's all happening at Marketo for that language already. Does that make yeah. sense? Yes, right. yes, so uh, exactly. So if I'm in Japan and I know that I have a, where is uh, Japan? Right here. Um, whoops. Anyway, uh, if I'm a, the, 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 I'm a native uh, Japanese speaker, I fill that in, it, that goes to uh, whoever's responsible for handling that market and working with that lead. So uh, I would assume that there's no translation needed. Good question, though. Yes? Sorry, no, they're not sent. Oh, sorry, the, the translations aren't sent to UK. The original node is created uh, in the UK. These yes. Yeah, yeah, I think I think so. The question is, what? How does the translation? F like, I would imagine workflow. you're asking, what is the workflow from getting a uh, something about a ThinkPad slide uh, component or blade into a different language and on the site? So the workflow is uh, corporate communications generates um, the marketing uh, campaign and the different sections of the site. Um, that gets generated in English. Once that gets saved, that node gets saved, 100 more nodes in the supported languages are generated. Those are then sent to Lionbridge, translated. Once the translation happens, the market, the, the geo, what we call the geographic uh, uh, organization Reason. that's responsible for marketing to that country is notified that this translation has been done, and then they can further, oh, I just got cut off, that's great. Uh, oh no, um, then they further massage the content, for lack of a better word, and then publish it. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay, we have, oh, we have maybe time for like 30 seconds, yes. Mm -hmm. So So the, we have paragraphs and uh, layout builder on this site. So for example, the way um, like let's say this is a block. This block in itself will be translated into 100 different languages, and then the, then the geo that manages this language uh, country pair will have control over whether they publish this particular block or not. All right, I'm sorry, we, uh, it's uh, 220 or 1220, oh well, my goodness. Uh, thank you very much, really appreciate your attention and questions, and we're here, of course, to take more questions. Thank you, and thank you for laughing in the beginning, that made me feel good. <laughs>